So we're going to be continuing on this week with Kingdom Living. Last week was a bit of an introduction, and uh, I tried to talk a little bit about some of the cultural things um, between East versus West and how the Bible is written versus how we think today. Uh, I will be going back to some of that, uh, uh, and I will be doing some of that next week. Uh, this week we're going to be setting some uh, preparatory work for uh, what it means to pray and how to pray and what, what, is, what it's all about in the Bible. Uh, before we do that, I would like to pray. So let's uh, begin this sermon on prayer with a little bit of prayer. So if you would join me, please. Father, I would just like to say to you that uh, we would like you to teach us how to pray. We know that disciples regularly come and ask you to show us how to pray. And so, Father, today we would ask that you would teach us how to pray so that we might learn to connect your kingdom into our lives and to know who you are and what you can do and what we can do as far as asking for things, judging our hearts, and learning how to live in your kingdom as good servants and members. And I just pray that uh, you would bless this time today, that we would learn more about your word. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So this is kind of the, this is kind of the key for the entire series, and it's this verse right here. Maybe if I say it every Sunday, you can commit it to memory. It's a good one to commit to memory. It says, have nothing to do with myths and old wives' tales. Rather, discipline yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So the idea, and I was just watching again today, you know, how many exercise commercials, you know, the infomercial, they go, this is going to get you going, and this is going to, you're going to tone those abs, you know, and biceps or whatever, you're going to, and I, thought, I saw this one, it was kind of funny, there's a new one where you're climbing, you know, you're climbing, you know, the climbing thing, you see that one? Yeah, that, that was, how many people would be smiling, they're all smiling while they're doing that, they got this like smiling look on their face, if you're exercising, you're really exerting yourself, are you, you have a still looking grin on your face? No. That's because they're being paid. <laughs> That's right, they're being paid. And so they're smiling as they're climbing. Okay, that is of some value. The Bible says that is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way. So what does that mean? That godliness also has value for physical training. Ah. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because if godliness has value in every way, it has value for diet and exercise as well, right? So the key thing here is, is that we should be training ourselves for godliness. And uh, one thing I would say is that this is not just, you know, something that has nothing to do with everyday life. And this week, as we are experiencing over there in France, uh, the world seems to be in an uproar about this. Of course it's been happening. Uh, it's funny that you see this in France and then you learn that it also happened in Kenya, about the same amount of people targeting uh, believers, Christians, professed Christians in a school, killed 147. That was back on April 2nd, but I didn't know about that until this one. And so that to me is a little concerning. However, uh, these things are not just happening one at a time. It's just the ones that the media picks up on and, and tends to broadcast, but hundreds of people are dying every day for their faith. And the thing is, is that have we disciplined ourselves for godliness? Are you ready if something happens? Now, how is the prayer life? How is the, how is the biblical attitude? How is the kingdom? How do you represent God in all of this, right? And so these things, this sermon, this, this entire series on how to live in the kingdom is not just something that is for tomorrow or this is something interesting or something to learn on Sunday. This will have uh, a great amount of value, especially as the times get rougher and especially as we see more of these things happening in the world. So we've got our list here, everything that's going on. Uh, I went through all these last week. And this week we're starting with uh, item number one here and there's spiritual training, which is praying. So we'll be talking about prayer. And this happens to be part one of prayer because I don't know how many sermons I'm going to teach on prayer. You could come, one, come here one Sunday, okay, we're on to the next thing. Uh, because I'm going to go at a pace where I think that we'll be able to get the most out of it. So uh, this week uh, I have not included any Hebrew words of prayer, which I will be doing. I have not included any deep uh, Bible study on prayer. I want to talk a little bit about kind of the attitude behind prayer and kind of the, the basic components of what it is, starting out on a very, a very basic level of all of this so that we can really kind of grasp what we're talking about. Um, the first thing that I'd like to 
uh, talk about is that uh, God's people, his people from every walk of life, from every culture, from every nation under heaven, uh, God's people are called to be a people of prayer. And it comes right out of Isaiah. This is 56, 6 through 7. It says, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people for all peoples, for all nations. Now, the part that is in the middle there and is underlined are the exact words of Jesus when he was cleansing out the temple. He said, My Father's house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. You see? So this is a familiar passage, uh, not only from Isaiah, but also in the New Testament. So, what does this mean? This means that God's people are people of prayer. I was reading a site, and although we have a wonderful motto, our national motto is wonderful, and it, our national motto is in God we trust. And it's not Allah. We don't trust in Allah. We don't trust in a Hindu God. We don't trust in all the gods. There is one God we trust in. The God that we trust in is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are many people in this nation today trying to say that our country is, was here to, to provide a place for all religions to come. Yes, all religions can come here, and all religions can, can practice their faith here. But the idea that this was a nation founded on all religions is not correct. This nation was founded on one religion, or one book, and one people. And that is the book of the Bible, and the people of the Bible, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what the God of this nation is. And we are not... Uh, Although it is nice that we say that in God we trust and we are following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are not the first nation to do so or to say so. We are actually uh, uh, one of the other nations. We are, we are part of the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord because the first people who proclaimed in God we trust was the people who stood at the foot of Mount Sinai saying that whatever you say, we will do. They're going to put their entire trust in God. So God established a people on the earth to establish a kingdom on the earth so that he would call a people to himself. And then from all the nations scattered across the earth, he would call a kingdom amongst them. And all the people from all over the earth shall come together and pray to one God under heaven and earth, over heaven and earth, and we under heaven uh, pray to him as well. So my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples or all nations. And so, what should the attitude of, of prayer be? Now, we have, in our country, we're very entitled, maybe is what I would say. Entitled. And especially, this happens in churches. We are very entitled. When we come to God, we come with a, a bit of an entitlement type of attitude. Now, you might think, well, entitlements, you know, entitlements are a bad thing because people take for granted things that they, you know, they should earn. And that is a little bit of the sense that I am using this word. And the idea is, is on the one hand, how do I explain this? On the one hand, we should feel entitled to come before the presence of God on any matter and boldly walk up to the throne. However, how do you approach the king? How do you address him? Do you come to the king saying, I have this and I have that, therefore you must do this? Right? And there are a lot of people in this country, and this has gone around the world as well, that believe that since we uh, have a certain position with the Lord, that we can just barge in through the gates of heaven, tell him what to do, and then he has to do it for us. Well, that is, that's kind of like a spoiled brat. Like, I have children, right? If my children came in to me, and I'm going to give them dinner, I'm going to give them food. I'm going to give them shelter. I'm going to give them many things, right? But if they came in and said, well, I'm your son, or I'm your daughter, and you owe this to me, so you have to do it, so this is what I need you to do, and I need you to do it right now. I'd go, I'm like, who are you to talk to me this way? Number one, I'm doing these things already. And number two, you should be grateful for what you get. And number three, I'm going to do more than you are asking or thinking because I love you. But now that you're being this way, I'm going to have to teach you a little bit of a lesson when you come to me. You're not, you know, because I can't have this type of uh, pride and arrogance coming in, in, into, this, into this dynamic. You know? So there is a certain propriety. There is a certain order. Not that we don't have 
the things of God, but that we don't presume to have them, even if we do. You see? Because what we're about here is we're talking about kingdom living. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what a kingdom is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about who God is and who we are as a people of that kingdom. Because God would like us to act a, a certain way. So notice what the disciples say when they come to the Lord. They come to the Lord and they say this, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, do you think that they did not know how to pray beforehand? I mean, they've been praying all their lives, right? Every time they wake up, they have a prayer. They go and they pray three, maybe five times a day, right? It's part of their culture. Prayer is part of their culture. Uh, in fact, the weapon of the Jewish people, you know, the weapon of the Jewish people was not swords. It was not chariots. That's why, uh, who, wrote the, who wrote it? I think it was a psalm. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So how do you access the name of the Lord your God? It's through prayer and through your mouth. It's through your lips. It's your speech. It is prayer that is our ultimate weapon. You see? And so they are well versed in prayer. They are well versed in every aspect of prayer. They've been doing it since they were young. They've been immersed in a culture that prays constantly. Right? So why do they come up to the Messiah and say, Lord, teach us how to pray? Because even with all of that knowledge and all of that practice, they still go, you know what? I still don't know how to do it as well as I would like. I still need to learn. In fact, if I need to unlearn everything I know about prayer and have the Messiah teach me how to pray, I will learn that, you see? And so with us, it's the same attitude. You want to know how to pray? Well, the first step in knowing how to pray and knowing how to access the kingdom of God is admitting that you don't know enough about it. How can you learn something if you already know it? How can you say, Lord, teach me to pray, and then go, okay, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Now, what can you add to this? You see? It's not, what can God add to our prayer life? How does he want us to do it? In fact, you can pray this prayer every day. Lord, teach me how to pray. Why? Because I don't know exactly what to say. I don't do it exactly how it should be done. And so the idea, remember, last week we talked about, it was not about arriving. It's not like, I know how to pray. As soon as the words, I know how to pray, crosses your lips, you've admitted your ignorance. Because obviously, there's some, some things you can learn, right? Which means you don't know fully how to pray. Which means that there's things that you can learn. And so, coming to God say, Lord, teach me how to pray. You have to forget the things that you know in order to learn the things that you don't know. Because the things that you know will block the things that you don't know from coming to your mind, you see. And that's not to say that the disciples or you or I are totally inexperienced with prayer. And that's not to say that we have been doing it wrong for 30 or 40 years or however long we've been praying or, or, or whatever. What it's to say is that I have a limited knowledge of prayer. God has infinite knowledge of prayer. And I would like to be better at the discipline of prayer. And I will never arrive at complete knowledge of prayer in this lifetime, but I can learn and get better day by day. And then you can get so good that well, you know how to pray. That keeps you humble, right? What if someone came, wow, you're a real prayer warrior. You know how to pray. And you go, why, thank you. I've been working hard at it, and it's nice to know that you say that I finally arrived. So I must have. I've arrived at the prayer, and I know what I'm doing. No, it keeps you humble, and this is what God likes. God does not want servants in kingdom that go, well, I know how to do this, and I know how to do that. This is kind of the American way. I am confident. I am an individual. I am of the self, and I know how to do these certain things, and I have these skills, and acknowledge me for my accomplishments. But God says, God says the better way is to be accomplished, but acknowledge that you still have a ways to go. Because what happens? What happens is if someone comes to you, and says, wow, you know a lot about praying. Well, I'm still learning about that. And they say, wow, he, even he needs to learn some more things. And, and then it tells the other person that you don't, you're not proud. You're not arrogant. You're not better than they are, right? Because they'll say, well, he's accomplished or she's accomplished. 
and yet he still needs to learn. Well, that must mean that I must still need to learn some things. And it develops an attitude of humility, not only in the people who know uh, and are practiced, but the people who are up and coming, you see? And so God wants this attitude of humility to permeate those who are high and those who are low in order that all might be built up. One of the things that happens is uh, as, as a liberal type mindset creeps into the congregations of God, even in our circles, what happens is, is that people tend to, tend to say, well, you know, that person, they're going to teach I pray. And, well, I have, I've been praying all these years. Right? And, and I know, and how dare this person come and say something, you know, that, that their way is better. Or, and, my, and you get into an argument, right? So that's that whole Western civilization type thing. Like, there's this way, there's this way, we're going to debate which ones are better, whichever, whoever wins, that will be the top. Rather, the, the biblical mindset that comes through the scriptures is that we are all learning. The novice has something to share, and the expert has something to share, and we can all learn from each other. And then it's in the practice of it, and the actual doing of it, where we see the, effect of, the effectiveness of our prayers, and know that it's actually correct and right, and things are progressing, right? And so, the attitude is, Lord, teach us to pray. The attitude is never, I know how to pray. The attitude is not that I pray better than, than you or anybody else. The attitude is, is that God is teaching me how to pray, and if you submit to God, he will teach you as well, right? Because all of this stuff is free for everyone. But some of us are near the finish line on the racetrack than near the beginning. And some of us, even though we're old, might be at the beginning of the prayer racetrack as far as it goes. And some of us who are young might be have progressed further along the racetrack. So it doesn't matter where you're at along the spectrum of where you are as far as how you know how to pray. It matters what your attitude is as you learn. So the attitude is everything when, it's, uh, when you're learning how to do something new. And this attitude is, Lord, teach us how to play. So humility. Um, I know, but I'm not going to lord that knowledge over you. I, I, I have reached a certain level. However, uh, I'm not going to glory in that. I'm going to look at the things that I don't know rather than the things that I do know. Paul said it when he said that I have done many things and he listens to all of his credentials and I go, it's nothing. It's nothing because I'm still, I'm still progressing. You can progress a long ways and still have a long ways to go. You see? And so humility is the key. This attracts people to what you're doing. It's attractive to be humble because people go, Wow, he's so good, or she's so good, and, and when she prays, God answers it, and they have a wonderful prayer, and so disciplined, right? Well, all those things come through, lots of hard lessons, heartache, and years of practice. It doesn't just come overnight. You don't just become a prayer warrior overnight. You don't just learn prayer overnight. It comes through repeated lessons, lots of time, you see? And so... And so the idea of doing that is that you have all that, but you still know you have a long way to go. That keeps you sharp. If you think you already know everything and you've arrived in some place, how, how, how much are you going to work on it some more? <laughs> You're going to stop, right? Well, I've accomplished that, right? So. Humility. Unpretentious. The idea that uh, you're not going to pursue, if you're going to enter upon God, you, he said that he will grant you every desire. Your every desire, as long as it is in line with the, the kingdom of God. If you pray according to God's will, he will grant your every uh, desire and wish. Right? So do you go and go, hey, God, you said you're going to grant my every desire and wish, and this seems to be along with your kingdom, so therefore, you need to do it. That's pretentious, isn't it? That's presuming upon God that he has to do the things that you say because you've done certain things and you think it's like this, this contract between the two. And actually, it's not. What it is is uh, if you come, your request is much more likely to be granted. Your prayer is more likely to be heard if it comes because you say to God, I don't deserve this. Even if you deserve it, you would say, I don't deserve this. Why? Because to presume upon God is to put your will and then trying to enforce it over His. You see? If you have no pretension, and even if you know in all of Scripture, by all of what it says, that by rights you should get something, still you would say, Father, 
Or, Lord, I am undeserving of this. But if it be your will, and if you would like, then perhaps you will grant it as a favor. And then God hears that and goes, wow, that's music to my ears. That's the right attitude. That's humble. He's not presuming to know more than me. Man, I'm going to do what I can. It gets God working for you. And in fact, if you use this, right, guess what? If you call and you're dealing with someone over the phone or you're dealing with someone person to person, and let's say that you have rights. Let's say you have rights. And it says it in the law, and it says it here, and it says it there, and you've got it, right? And they have to do what you say. And you say, you have to do what I say because it says it right here, and this is it. And you put all your argument, you get your debate out, and, then, and you bend them to your will. And they go, yeah, well, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to like it. Or worse, they'll say, yeah, they might think that, but I'm going to find a way to, to, to deny them that just because they're so pretentious. They, they're presuming so much. And even though they're right, I don't want to do it. But if you said, then try it next time. Try it next time. You'll see something on the board, right? Uh, like at a restaurant, maybe you got a, a coupon deal or something like that, and you say, is it okay if I use this coupon? Now you know it's okay to use the coupon. We use coupons all the time, right? Is it okay if I do this? Oh yeah! In fact, let me throw in this and this and this. You're so nice. You, see, you want to get more? You do not presume upon things. You presume that you won't get those things, right? Or you ask even though it's yours, right? You, you watch the doors of heaven swing wide open when you do this. You watch people brighten up and lighten up as you do this. Because why? Because even though you have all the power, you're not exercising over them. You're still asking as a request. This is how royal language works. Royal Kingdom language. Now, we read Royal Kingdom language and we don't understand it whatsoever. Kingdom language it says, the king would say to his servant, uh, we, because he wouldn't say I, because it says like, I'm over you. The king would never say, I'm over you. He would say, we would wish, now this is where your wish is my command comes from. We would wish that the doors to the court would be guarded with a double guard. Could you do that? Would that be okay? The king would say this to someone underneath him. Why? Why would the king? The king could just say, go do that. And the guy would have to do it, right? But the king would say, we would wish that a double guard would be put on the door. And they're like, absolutely, sire. Your wish is my command. Because it is humility going forward. Because if you exert authority over people, it tends to backfire on you. Because that's how God made us. So if we having all authority, then choose to not exert it, but to ask, to request, to be, you see how that is? That's a royal way to do things. That's a kingdom way to do things. So to eliminate pretension from your prayers will go a long way. And that's where some of the prosperity and other people, the name and acclaim it type uh, philosophies uh, tend to fail. The God who likes those types of prayers is not the God of the universe. He's the other guy. Right? And he grants, which is like, you know, like on a legalistic basis. However, God, while he will grant those as well, if they're in line with his kingdom, he much prefers the humble approach, the, the, the non-presumption approach. And you have to be, obviously, your attitude has to be teachable. You have to be able to be questioning, right? You have to have some self-evaluation. When you pray, you have to say, wow, did that, did that work? How did you know if a prayer worked? Well, you see the fruit of it. Well, you might not know the fruit of the prayer. You might pray for something. You might not ever see what happens on the other side. So how do you know if it worked or not? Because you know inside of yourself if it worked for you. You know how you feel after you pray. You know what God did in your life after you pray. You see? If you're doing God's will, God sends you, fills you with a sense of fulfillment. You get a spiritual uplift from it. Your day gets better. You start to, to come up. There's an idea that prayer elevates you. And why does it elevate you? It elevates you because you are not acting according to your natural impulses any longer. You're acting according to a divine principle. And if you act according to divine principles, it brings you up closer to God, you see? And so if you pray within the 
kingdom of God, if you pray within his will, you will be lifted up. If you're humble, you will be lifted up. If you know God has answered your prayer, because in your spirit, he is speaking with you. You see, that's teachable. And so then you go, well, how do I know that my prayer worked? Because on a level, you understand that you are putting into practice the kingdom principles of God, and he blesses your life through your prayers. Right? It's not a question of whether I should pray or not. Because prayer is a commandment. It's a question of how am I praying? Right? And so how can I, how does, it, how does it work? How do I get better? And to know, you won't be able to learn. But to be teachable means that you show up and you're waiting and you're willing to learn what God would have to say. So, that, those are the three things about the attitude of prayer. That's by way of introduction. So, at its most basic form, prayer is predicated upon three things. Three things. And these are the three things. Uh, who God is. Right? If you pray to an idol that doesn't see, doesn't hear, doesn't speak, and doesn't act, your prayer is useless. Right? It depends on what you're praying to, whether it's effective or not. So who are we praying to? Who is God? What, what is it about Him that causes us to need to pray? You see, I read something that was interesting this week, and maybe I'll just insert it here because it's a good place, I guess. All of God's commandments, every single one of them, are not given for his benefit. They're for our benefit. God commands us to pray not because he needs us to pray, not because he needs us to do anything at all. Right? Every single commandment of God is not a God saying, hey, you need to do this, you know, or I'm not going to be happy. God's happy. God's fine. God's, God has all the power. Like if I were to go to a billionaire and say, hey, you know, I'd like to give you $20. Does he care if I give him $20 or not? Absolutely not. He's got more $20 than he can ever spend in his entire lifetime. He cares not about my $20. And that's the king of the universe. He already has it all already. He has everything he could ever want, need, desire. He's already got it all. So his commandments are not so that he looks better. His commandments are so that you can elevate yourself to where he is. You see? You need to ascend from the base nature called the flesh and ascend to the spiritual nature, which is the divine, which is God in heaven. And that happens through prayer. You see? So God who is? Who is God? Who is, this, who is this person? Once we have a proper understanding of who God is, then we need to know who we are. And who we are is much more than we know. You don't, you don't know who you are in God's economy of things because we have a small view of ourselves and we have a small view of God. But to God, we are the most important thing. To God, we are his children, you see. So if you know who God is, and then you know who, who you are, or who we are, I like to say the we because it's community. And then how do we connect who we are to who God is? You see, there's, there's a path. There's a way that you have to go from where you are to where God is. So we have to travel from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. And it happens through prayer. It connects heaven and earth together. Does it not? If someone is in need and we pray, what are we calling on? Are we, just, are we just saying nice words to make them feel better? Are we just saying nice words to make us feel better? Or are we calling on the power of heaven to connect itself to the earth and actually interact with us? Right? If you pray, you are calling down the kingdom of heaven to interact with here what's going on here in the earth. You are calling on the resources of God for your own life. You're calling on the kingdom to be established within the earth because you understand what that kingdom is and what it will do once it's birthed in the earth. And I can tell you one thing that will not happen, and that will be things like what happened in Paris this last week. That's not part of God's kingdom, you see? So, who God is? In Exodus 3.14, Moses asks this very question. 
He goes, I'm going to go to Israel and I'm going to say that this God spoke to me. Who should I say sent me? They're going to want to know this. And so God reveals something about his very nature to Moses at that very spot at the burning bush. He says, I am that I am. You could also say that he said, I am because I am. Or I exist because I exist. Or I exist by my own existence. Which means what? God is the self-existent one. He is the one who is. He is just there. He is the one that everything points to. The creator of the universe. So if you're calling on, so who are you praying to? Are you praying to Allah? No. Allah is a Allah is nothing compared to the God of the universe. Are you praying to Vishnu? To, to, to some other idol, you know? Ganesh, Shiva. You know, let's, we'll just name them off. What are they? They are nothing. They could not, by their own effort, cause themselves to exist in this reality. God, by his very words, spoke everything into being. That's why words are the most powerful thing in the universe. By words, everything came into being. He is the one who has always existed because he exists in and of himself. There's no outside force that, that limits him. There's nothing outside of him that tells him what to do, who to be, or where to go, or anything. He unites the very fabric of the universe together. Where he looks, order comes. When he looks away, chaos reigns. You see, he's the king of the universe. The king of the universe. It says in Jeremiah 10.10 10, that he is the everlasting king. In fact, let's, let's just go to Jeremiah 10.10 10, because that one is not as familiar. If we go to Jeremiah 10, verse 10, it's, it's interesting. But the Lord is the true God. There is the word yod heh vav -He is the true Elohim, God. And he is the, the living God, an everlasting king, Melech. You know, there's lots of stories about kings who wanted to be eternal, you know. They, they built monuments so that they could, they could live through the ages. But God is the eternal king, which means that no one can dethrone him. No one can, can exert another kingdom, another law, another rule of order over him. He is the top of everything that is, you see. So he's the king of the universe. If you go further, at his wrath... The earth quakes. That means when he doesn't like something, the very earth shakes. How many earthly kings, when they get upset, does the earth shake? You could, you could feel like it's shaking if they have a thunderous, booming voice and you happen to be in the court where they're presiding. However, the very ground does not make an earthquake. Well, when God raises up his voice, the very earth shakes at the sound of his voice. That's what this is saying. This is, and the nation cannot endure his indignation. That means that there is a, that's no kingdom can stand in the face of him. I mean, we want to have weapons, right? We've got nuclear bombs. We've got, uh, we've got uh, bunker busting bombs. We've got smart bombs. We've got drones. We've got all this stuff, right? Can we subdue all the nations of the earth? No. If all the nations of the earth came up against us, would we be able to survive it? No. But all the nations of the earth could come against God and they would be like cannon fodder. You see? Because he's the king of the universe. Now, our idea of a king is not our idea of God. Right? Because we tend to think of kings, I mean, especially in America, right? Kings are the people that tax you, make your life hard. Kings are tyrants. Kings are evil. Kings are bad. Right? That's not God. God is a good king. He is a righteous king. He's a just king, right? His kingdom is where everyone is satisfied, protected, healthy, happy, fulfilled. You see? The king reflects what his subjects are like. And the subjects reflect what the king is like. So if you went to a kingdom and everybody was poor and digging in the dirt and fighting and bickering and arguing with one another and, and, and stabbing each other in the back, that would reflect on the king himself and his kingdom because he does not have the proper amount of order and discipline and, and the proper amount of goodwill and mercy and kindness. 
He doesn't have all of those attributes, those divine kingly type attributes that would make his kingdom flourish. It would begin to die, you see. But a good king, a good king knows how justice works. And he is completely just and fair. And not only is he completely ever just and fair, but everybody knows it. And nobody goes like, well, that king is unjust. If someone wondered, well, that king is a jerk, and he said this, and the other people would rise up around him and go, yeah, well, who, why do you say he is unjust and unfair? You're the one who is slandering the king. He is not unjust and unfair. It's your problem, not his. You see? That, a good king is like that. God is a good king. He is the most, a good, an evil king does not create the universe. An evil king does not create families and love and happiness. An evil king only destroys his people and uses them for his own gain. So there's two rulers. The king of this world, which is the enemy of, of the kingdom, of believers, is the one who would come and steal and kill and destroy. But the good king is the one who gives everlasting life. In fact, the good king doesn't just sit up in heaven on his throne and issue edicts down, the good king comes down off of his throne and lives by example amongst his people. It's kind of like the king uh, who put on the peasant cloaks to go live among the people to see how things really were so he could fix them. So we've got those stories. Well, that's what the God of the universe did. He came down. He comes down. He looks and, and walks among his people. He walks along the earth and he sees how things actually are and then he does things in order to correct those because he's a wonderful king, you see. He's the king of the universe, right? And also he's the everlasting father. This is out of Isaiah 9, 6. But when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, what did he say? Our father who is in heaven. Because we're his children. So this is a, these are two things. We think of a king as someone who is a ruler over. But we think of a father uh, of someone who is loving and kind, hopefully, right? So an everlasting father means he's the eternal father because he made everything and he considers us his children, right? So we have a king of the universe that rules our, but that king is also our father, right? So how many of you thought, oh man, it would be nice if I, if I lived in a royal house and I didn't have to worry about anything and I could pursue my own, uh, I could pursue pursue my interest, you know, and serve the kingdom and, and, and do what the king asks. And that'd be nice. Why? Because the king can provide for your every need. You see? And so you would serve that king. And you would, wouldn't it be nice? You know, what if someone came you know, and said, hey, you know what? By a long line of succession, we found through genealogies and we've searched it out that you're actually uh, a titled lord, right? And you have lands and a castle and servants awaiting uh, to wait on you. Would you go like... I don't want to do all that. Or would you go like, well, I'd at least like to try it out and see what it's like. So guess what? Your father, if you choose to accept him as your father, is the king of the universe. That means that when you ask him for something, it's not asking the king as a lowly subject. It's like asking your father for something. Your father happens to be the most important thing in the universe. Whoa, that's a little bit different tact, isn't it? Right? Do you, and so the Father loves you, and you love the Father, because it's like a family, you see? And he wants to make us his royal family. And I'll show you exactly what that's like here in the next, who we are. We are God's treasured possession. We are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If you took the basic Bible study method that I did, we'd go over this, this verse in 1 Peter 2.9 and its direct connection in Exodus 19.5 and 6. And the reason why those things are connected is because Peter, or Simon Peter, Shimon Kepha, Peter is trying to tell those that he writes this letter to who they are in God's kingdom. You see? So treasured possession means that God has chosen us out of all the peoples of the earth. Why has he chosen us? Because we have agreed to live by his kingdom rules. We want to say, I want to come into the house. He's provided a way for us to have royal blood pumping through our veins. 
he said that, you know, what's the, what's the problem with royalty? It's all about bloodlines, right? It means you can't be royal unless you were born to a royal family, right? Like, I can't just go and say, hey, you know what? My grandmother actually has some royal blood way back, 1300s. It's way back there. I could actually go into Europe and go, hey, you know, this, it's, been, it's been commoners for so long. But there's this whole thing between commoners and royalty, right? And you cannot get into that, that club because why? Because you're not born right. You're not born to the right parents. And we go like, wait a minute. That's wrong. Why can't I be? There, there's no difference between you and me. We're both people. And we just rail against that. And so that gives us a negative outlook about kingdom and royalty and all this other stuff. But what if I were to tell you that in God's kingdom, he has a way to make what is common holy. What, what, is, what is born a blood that will not be kingdom blood. He can, he can bring you into the kingdom and give you the, his bloodline through his Messiah and say that you are now part of the royal bloodline. You now have the responsibilities, the rights, the obligations, and the benefits of being in the kingdom. You see? And all you have to do is swear fealty to the king of the universe. I will serve him. I will love him. I will do his commandments. And he goes, okay, based on your word, I will bring you in to the kingdom. Guys, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You think that, well, many people, I don't know if you think that, many people think, you know, well, I'm going to ask Jesus to come into my heart and then I'm going to be saved and it's all going to be good. It's so much bigger than that. That is true. You ask God to cover your sins and Jesus died for your sins on the cross and you can enter into the kingdom. But friends, that is just a small part of what God is calling you to do. He's giving you the rights, the responsibilities, and the benefits of being part of a royal family of a kingdom that will never go away. An eternal kingdom of light, of love, of happiness, where you will have fulfilling work to do from now into eternity. But he does not send his royal children to be pampered here on this earth. He goes, you want to be part of the family? Let me show you how our family works. What is our royal kingdom? What is my idea of, of being good? It's not to lord your rulership over people, but to serve them. Because what makes us great as a kingdom is our service to other people, our service to God, our attitude in times of trouble, our prayers on our behalf, on our family's behalf, and on behalf of the world, our reconnecting heaven and earth together in our own lives and those around us. That is a kingdom. And it's so much more than being saved as, you know, a speck of dust to the stars in the heavens, you see. Being saved is good. Being part of the kingdom is a whole other world. And I'm glad people are saved. But we need to start being the kingdom. The kingdom of God's treasured possession. A priest. What do priests do? They connect the heaven, the divine, with the common. To bring it out. Right? And to be separated from holiness. It's not easy to be holy. Why? Because we want to be just like everybody else. We want to take our high position and mix it with things that are undeserving of the kingdom. You see, there's a certain pride and arrogance that goes with being part of the kingdom. You know, that's not right. I mean, God doesn't. But see, that pride and arrogance is in the fact that God's ways are higher than the base ways that are on. And we don't just take that and go, well, I'm part of the kingdom and you're not. Right? We said, look, we want to raise you up. How God is how we are, you can be as well. All you have to do is swear fealty to the king and put his commandments into practice and to learn how to pray to him. To learn how to access the kingdom. To learn how to connect things. Right? If you do that, you're not common. So it's the kingdom where everybody has an oper equal opportunity to be part of it. If they would just ask. You see? With your words. 
The difference between heaven and hell are the words of your mouth, and that is it. The words of your mouth and the actions that you take on behalf of those. So here it is. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a song. I, I firmly believe that every song that we have that just plays in our head, the reason that that's a song and that's so popular and we all know it is because God, as a king, has decreed. He was up on his throne room and he heard this song and he goes, that is a good song. Everyone should know this. Therefore my decree goes out that all in the land of Christendom, those who believe in my word shall know this verse by this song. And so that's why we have it in our heads when we start seeing it on the screen. There was a divine edict that said, this song is good. Everybody should know it. And then we all do. Because that's how God's kingdom works. You see, there's things going on up in the throne room in, he uh, in heaven. We'll see it in scripture. They're coming up, they're talking to God. There's things that are going on in the throne room of heaven. Right? The altar of incense is the prayers of all of us going up before the Lord. And he goes, Oh, those are the prayers of my people. I like those. And then he looks at every request. And, and, and he does this. This is my decision in this matter. 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 And every single decision is perfect. You see? How do you access the kingdom? You pray. And when you pray, God then hears that prayer and he makes a decision upon it. Right? Sometimes, when that prayer goes up, the first thing that's looked at is not the prayer. It's the heart attitude of the one praying. So there's two, there's two things. First of all, God says he gives grace. He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So what does that mean? If you pray with pride and arrogance, he's going to oppose that request. Right off the jump, no matter what it is. He's like, mm, it might be good, but there's a lot of pride and arrogance there. I will grant that request. Granted, the person changes their attitude. <laughs> and he can do it that way. And then we look at the request itself and go, okay, it was asked with the right attitude. Uh, and this is one who has come, and I know this child of mine. I know what this child of mine needs, and what they're asking for is good, but not at this time. What they're asking for is good, and I will grant it. What they're asking for is not good. They don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're praying about. I will not grant it in that way. It will hurt them. You see? So all these requests come up in the incense altar before God in his throne room, and he makes a decision based on the heart attitude of the one praying and the content of the prayer. And we know this straight from Scripture. So what do we do? What do we do? We learn how to pray. As we learn how to pray, then we develop the proper attitude. Right? And then God grants our requests. And so we connect the two, and this is going to be short. There's, these, these are like levels, levels of prayer. They're not necessarily in order. But the first thing is the idea of prayer. And I'll get into the meaning of the word prayer next week. But it doesn't mean just to plead, to beg, and entreat. That's kind of the English meaning of the word prayer. The Hebrew meaning of the word prayer has more along the lines uh, on, on judgment, on to judge. It's really interesting, and I'll go into it in more detail next week. But the idea to connect heaven and earth, right, you start out. Now, you might think, have you ever heard the term, that person is acting like an animal? That's, a, that's a, like a phrase. Well, that guy's a... Or, you know, he's, he's acting like an animal. I remember reading Chronicles of Narnia, and it's more like a British term. It goes, Edward was acting beastly toward Lucy. He was just being beastly toward her. Oh, that person is a beast. What does that mean? That means that they're going what is natural, normal, and what all people do. When you get angry at something, and you lash out. That's beastly. Right? God's idea is when something happens to you, you don't get angry and you lash out. That's being human. You see? So we're all on a sliding scale from the animal to the human. To be more human is to be like God. Because when God created humans, they were godly. 
So that's why we want to discipline ourselves for godliness, because we're trying to be better humans. We're ascending from the beast to the human. God recognizes humans, beasts he doesn't care for. As far as being part of the kingdom and being a son or a daughter of the kingdom, he doesn't, he doesn't give his gifts to beasts. He gives his gifts to humans. So to be more like God means to be more perfected, more human, and so the divine will overrides the natural will. You'll know them in scripture as the spirit and the flesh. The flesh is that beastly natural nature, that natural inclination to envy, to anger, to, to um, lashing out in unjust ways, to judge improperly the situation and react improperly to the facts that are set before us. And just by our very nature, you know, like people say, well, I can't help the way that I am. I was born this way. You know, I was just born this way. Yes. We were all born as beasts. We're all trying to become human by following the blueprint of what a human is. You see? So what comes natural to you, who you are born, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you think. You know, I hate to bring him up, but um, there's a man, you know who I'm talking about, very popular for saying that he was, he was born a woman even though his chromosomes are X and Y and will always be X and Y. But he says he was born, that's just the way I feel. There's a whole song by Lady Gaga, I was born this way. Yes, we were all born in sin. We were all born as animals. But we want to rise above that and become human. Right? And so prayer changes you from being a beast to being a human. Because you start looking at your own life. You start looking at what you're saying. You start looking at scripture. You start comparing the two. You start saying, what should my attitude be? Oh, my attitude should be this. And I reject my natural inclination toward improper anger, improper lust, improper whatever, lying, cheating, stealing, all those beastly things that people do, killing, murdering, cheating, beastly things. And we're going to rise above that through prayer to become divine beings of the kingdom. Sons and daughters worthy of God saying, this is my servant in whom I am well pleased. This is part of my kingdom. This is what my kingdom is. He takes a representative examples of his kingdom and says, this is my kingdom. This is my kingdom. This is my kingdom. This person gets it. This person gets it. That person is a beast. That's how it is. So prayer refines you into being that. And that's why it's commanded for you to do. Not because God needs you to be, you know, God needs to hear good things about himself. It's because you need to understand how the universe works. You need to change yourself. You need to be, elevate yourself. And then when that happens, there's another level. That level is worship. The worship, the word for worship in Hebrew is avodah, which means work. Right? So that means that your prayers of your mouth translate into actions of worship before God. Right? And actions of worship before God translate into physical manifestations of service to the kingdom. Right? So when you humble yourself, when you serve someone else, when you put someone else before you, you are then part of the kingdom of God that made that he put everyone ahead of himself, did not consider himself as God of the universe, you know, so high and mighty that he couldn't step down into his own creation and die on a, on a wooden stake, an ignoble death. The highest person in the universe became the most humble person in the universe in order to bring the entire universe up, to rescue it, to to reconnect the kingdom, to connect heaven and earth. And you are called to that same high calling if you will start with prayer. Because prayer leads to worship. Worship leads to service, you see. And these are the works that ascend you from the lower beastly nature to the divine nature of God. And as you ascend through that, you become a worker in the kingdom of God. So this is kind of a, a foundation toward that, that whole idea. If you get these lessons down, these three things of who God is, who you are, and how God treats his position, then you know how to treat your position. 
God is, if God is the, the highest one in the universe and he has become the lowest, then what do you do? You are part of the kingdom. You have everything at your disposal that God would give you. Right? But he doesn't give you too much because you couldn't handle it. You know, because he gave you too much power. Look, you might be complaining, well, I don't have enough money. Well, you haven't learned the lessons to so God can give you enough money. If you learn the lessons, God will give you more money. Why? Because if he gives you too much money, you know how many people win the lottery and they're broke five years later? Or they're divorced, or they've committed suicide, or, or something really terrible has happened to them. Why? Because all that amount of money causes stress. Now, why would God do that to you? You go, oh, if God loved me, I could, I could win that $10 million jackpot. No. No, because you couldn't handle the $10 million jackpot. <laughs> that $10 million jackpot would crush you, and God knows it. So he goes, yeah, yeah that's a good request. I like that request. You know, I see where you're coming from. However, uh, if I give that to you, it's going to hurt you. So the answer is no. And isn't that what we do with our children? Don't we want to give everything to our children? No. I want chocolate cake for morning, noon, and night. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's not going to work. I would love if, if I could eat, if you could eat, if we could all eat chocolate cake all the time. And that would be, you know, that would be wonderful. However, it's not how it works. So then you cannot have chocolate cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But you can have one piece here, you know, if you do all these other things. Why? Because we're looking out for them. We're not mean because we don't give them chocolate cake every meal. To be, to be mean would be to actually give them what they wanted, wouldn't it be? You see, God's the same way. He's not going to give you things that are going to hurt you just because, you know, you think that they're great. Too much of a good thing. You know, God knows these things. You see? So, we are going to learn what it means to pray. We're going to learn what that is and what it does for you and what it does for the kingdom and what it does for each other. You want your prayers to be heard. You want to be praying about the right things. You want to know what it is. You want to elevate yourself and your service to God. Well, we learn how to pray because God commanded to us because it's good for us. In fact, you see these three things, prayer, worship, and service? That is exactly what you were built for. You want to do these things. In fact, everybody on the planet wants to do these things. Why? Because that's how God made us. He made us to do these specific things. We're not just praying here on earth. We're praying from now into eternity. You see? Well, this does not stop. The prayer, the worship, and the service for God does not stop once you close your eyes for the last time. It goes on for eternity. Because this is what we were made to do. So do you guys want to learn what you were made to do? Yeah. All right. So this is kind of an introduction to the subject. So I did an introduction to the whole thing. And I did an introduction to the small one. Next week we're going to get uh, a Thanksgiving sermon. So bring all your friends. They can hear about the, the roots of Thanksgiving and how that works. And, you know, we're going to have a good time. And after that week, we're going to start getting into the nitty-gritty of learning to pray. So does that sound good? All right. Let's pray. That's a good deal. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you. We thank you for setting up your kingdom and letting us be a part of it, for bringing us in to be um, your servants, your people, your sons and daughters, your children, and all the rest. And Father, I would just ask, my request is this, that you would teach us to be your kingdom people, that we would learn the rules of the kingdom, we would learn the prayer, and we would learn how to walk as righteous servants worthy of your name in this world and beyond. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.